For the first time since the end of the season, Mike Tomlin's voice was heard, and it was heard loud and clear on one issue that really caught my attention. Good morning to you. Good Monday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Steelers. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into hockey and or baseball. I also happen to offer daily shots of Penguins and Pirates by no coincidence, and I do hope you will check those out as well. Tomlin spoke with reporters yesterday in Phoenix at the NFL's owners' meetings. That's something that he's done for a long time now, and when he's done it, in every case, it's followed that same gap, meaning he'll talk right when the season ends, and then you won't hear from him for months until this session. So it's usually pretty newsworthy. I I wouldn't call this one that, but there's no doubt in my mind that the most significant thing this team's done since the end of the season, and actually, in a way, the most surprising thing the team's done is the fortification of the offensive line. And in case you're wondering if I'm Using the right term there, here's what Tomlin had to say on the subject. But specifically in the offensive line, we just thought um, the more starter capable and starter experience like guys we could add to the group, we had an opportunity to to create competition and raise our floor. I think we were fortunate last year. uh, The five primary starters made every football game. And so our depth was not challenged. Um, It'd be naive to think that we could be in that circumstance again. Uh, And so we just felt like it was appropriate to to fortify depths, create competition, and you do that with capable people, specifically guys with starter capable experience. And and how we sort those guys out, man, remains to be seen. We'll get those guys in a competitive camp situation and, and come up with the best five. Yeah, I'd say that's fortification. That's basically Tomlin acknowledging that you're never going to have a back-to-back seasons of an offensive line staying as healthy as those guys did. It's something I've brought up here on the show. You'd be banking on a whole lot of hope for that to happen again. And as they say, hope is never a plan. So the Steelers go out and they spend gobs of money, most of it on Isaac Selmalo, but also on Nate Herbig and LaRaven Clark, Clark being the most recent addition to this group, people who can back up uh, the latter two uh, at guard and at tackle. Sal Malo is going to be starting at guard. Uh, Tomlin didn't want a whole heck of a lot to do with any sort of debate about what that means for Kevin Dotson, the most obvious man out. Or anyone else involved, there will obviously be time enough for that out in Latrobe. There will be competition set up, and maybe some of them will even be authentic. Most camp competitions are not. But the part that jumped out for me more than anything was Tomlin's reasoning for adding these O-line beyond the obvious that you'd need more depth. He really stressed the running game. And he stressed it. Well, here's what he had to say. I think a sound running game aids aids quarterbacks, particularly a young quarterback. Um, I don't think we're bashful about our intentions there. And um, we won't be moving forward. Yeah, now see, that you can get behind. Because it's not just about let's run the ball to run the ball. Let's run the ball because we have Najee Harris as a first-round running back. Let's try to make sure that the other team is keeping honest with their various defensive schemes and so forth. No, no. The real reason that you run the ball with a second-year NFL starting quarterback in his first full year as a starter is to protect him, is to make sure that he can do what he needs to do but again, in a way that keeps the other guys honest. If the other team knows that you can't run, well, we've seen what that looks like against a quarterback. We saw what it looked like against Ben Roethlisberger. We saw what it looked like against Mitch Trubisky. And yeah, we also saw what it looked like against Kenny. But guess what else we saw? We saw 
Kenny Pickett and the Steelers go 7-2 and two in the second half. And you know what they did along the way there? You know what was the single biggest difference between the first half and the second half Steelers? And if you say the schedule, that's a eh, because it's not that. The single biggest difference was that they ran the football effectively, averaging almost 150 yards a game on the ground. What can you expect at Point Park University in downtown Pittsburgh? Respect, rigor, relevance. That's the Point Park pledge. You'll be treated with respect while being challenged and supported academically to graduate with career-ready, relevant skills. Visit pointpark.edu to learn more. Credit Najee all you want. Credit Jalen Warren all you want. Credit those offensive linemen and their health, for that matter, since we're discussing it. Heck, you, you can throw some of it to Matt Canada even. That's not against the law. At least I don't think it is just yet. But that was the difference. They didn't tighten up defensively. They got better. They got better. They got steadier. They got a little bit healthier with TJ Watt back, but the defense didn't transform itself from first half to second half. The passing game really didn't get that much better. If you think back about it objectively, what happened was that the running backs ran. Najee ran. Jalen ran. They got first downs. They moved the sticks. They moved the sticks without Kenny having to do anything. And in the process, what do you know? The opposing defenses did have to bring more people up to the line, did have to make sure that they couldn't do this or do that to attack only one specific component of the Steelers' offense. And that, of course, made Kenny's life easier. And made Kenny a better quarterback. And made the offense somewhat more dangerous. I don't want to overstate that. A lot of what the offense did in the second half of the 2022 season was to rise up in the fourth quarter and rise up when needed most, which made for great drama, fun headlines, and all that other stuff. But they're still nowhere near where they need to be. And they knew that. And the best way to achieve that was always, always, always going to be through the O-line, either by making their existing guys better or by getting people that they feel are better to begin with. Would I still like to see more consistency in the passing game? Sure. Would I like to see a better version of Deontay Johnson show up for all 17 games? Sure. Would I like to see them use George Pickens more than they use anybody else? Yeah. Throw across the middle to Pat Fryermuth? Yeah, but all of that, all of it, becomes that much simpler with the O-line. Through all this, I haven't even mentioned pass blocking and giving Kenny more time and making more of his ability to scramble or even throw across his body. All of these things are positives, and they all start up front. When we come back, J1Q. This segment of Daily Shot is brought to you by the personal injury law firm of Luxembourg, Garbett, Kelly, and George, LGKG. They represent people who are hurt in car accidents, who need help with workers' comp, who filed for medical malpractice claims. The attorneys at LGKG have been keeping promises in our region for over 80 years. Learn more about them at LGKG.com or by calling 888-842-5454. Today's J1Q comes from Nate who says, Hey DK, I am genuinely saddened by the loss of Terrell Edmonds. I feel like People would always say he didn't make enough splash, but no one would ever say what he doesn't do well. Do you think that this is the reason that he's leaving, or do you think there's some underlying issue? I know you spoke about T.E. already, but I just hate to see him go. He was what a Steeler should be, in my opinion. Well, Nate, I'm not going to go over again how strongly I feel about him both as a player and person uh, once more. Everybody's heard that from me. As far as T.E. leaving for Philadelphia over the weekend. The details actually came out regarding his contract. That was yesterday in the Philadelphia Inquirer. And 
normally these are kind of boring subjects, but I think this one matters. That The contract was for one year and $2 million. Now, TE can also earn an additional 850000 for various incentives that are based on basically playing a lot, which has always been his forte. He's dependable. He's out there. If he's out there for all 17 games, he can max out at $2.85 million. That's not much in the National Football League. And that tells me that T.E. knew, and I mean knew, he was not in the Steelers' plans. Now, in turn, that could also tell me and tell all of us that this whole three-safety formation with the defense is as dead as dead can be, that it was fun while they had three safeties, fun while they considered it. Uh, Tomlin did mention to everybody yesterday that Brian Flores won't be replaced. His role was a little unusual to begin with last year, but he won't be back. And maybe that was more of a Flores thing, since we know for a fact that it originated with him, than it was a Terrell Austin thing. Maybe Austin doesn't want it. I'm starting to get into speculation here, which I don't like to do, but a lot of the time you have to just take pieces together because you don't have enough right in front of you. And if this team wasn't going to go with a three safety set and they'd already signed DeMonte Casey and they saw things in Casey's play that they liked and they must have, forgive me for this one in advance, not valued all that much that TE doesn't miss games and that Casey missed about half the season. So they chose their guy, and they decided to pay him, and they decided they weren't going to pay T.E. anything at all. And just like last year, when T.E. took the Steelers' similarly very low offer to return to Pittsburgh, the Eagles didn't pay up either. He just saw a situation, all right, I'll play for this. Maybe I'll prove myself again. Maybe someday, magically, the NFL's broader safety market will improve, although that doesn't appear to be on the horizon. If you're a safety right now in the league, unless you're Minka Fitzpatrick, you are not getting paid. But to what you're talking about, uh, you're suggesting, I think, hurt feelings or wanting a fresh start or something. No, no, the Steelers weren't paying them. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Steelers. We'll do another one of these tomorrow. 